Hello and welcome to uh, our 11th lecture, part number one. Uh, this is the first in our um, five parts of lecture number 11 on the visual system and visual coding. <coughs> We're going to start first with talking about properties of light. When we talk about uh, stimuli, one of the first things we have to understand is what are its physical properties because those physical properties then are associated with perceptual attributes. So we're going to start with talking about light. Light is uh, a bit of an unusual physical manifestation, as it were, uh, in that it is both a particle, that is photons that are emitted by a light source, traveling in an electromagnetic wave. So light is got this sort of unusual quantum property uh, in which we talk about photon capture. That is, photons are actually captured by um, cells in the retina, which causes a change in the protein structure of uh, the those cells. But they also travel in an electromagnetic wave in those wavelengths, and that wave property is part of what results in our perception of color. So we refer to light as the visible portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. So the electromagnetic spectrum runs from gamma waves up to radio waves. Gamma rays are the shortest in terms of their wavelength. Radio waves are their longest. So you can see this small portion here in the middle is the visible portion of the retina for humans from uh, about 420 nanometers up to uh, almost you know, seven something uh, nanometers, 700 something nanometers, sorry. Uh, the shorter wavelength lights are uh, located in the blue area, the middle wavelengths are in the green, and the longer wavelengths in the red. In the infrareds, we have things like heat. Some species can actually see a kind of infrared signature, and below that we have ultraviolet radiation, which some species can also see. Uh, ultraviolet light, of course, is known to be damaging to skin, also to um, cells in the retina, in particular the short wavelength cones that are uh, most likely to be absorbed by that ultraviolet light. First, I want to review the properties of waves. Uh, we'll be talking about waves both in uh, terms of light and sound. Uh, so we're talking about a light at this point. Remember, as uh, light is traveling, it's in a wave form. Light travels at 186,000 meters per second. We refer to the wavelength as the distance between peaks or troughs of the wavelength form, so one full repetition of the wave. We also, of course, talk about the amplitude, which is the height of the wave. For light, wavelength is associated with our perception of color, or hue, and the amplitude is associated with our perception of brightness. Uh, we'll also talk about number of photons released, which is another property. Um, but brightness is, in general, related to uh, amplitude, whereas hue is associated with wavelength. <coughs> so longer wavelengths are associated with um, more red colors, shorter wavelengths with blue colors, as you can see here. We also have shorter amplitude and higher amplitudes, which are associated with things like brightness. As I was saying, uh, wavelength is related to our perception of hue. Um, this is, is not one of my favorite um, charts of this because it to me seems backwards. The shorter wavelengths should be on the left. But over here we have the shorter wavelengths, the ultraviolets, violets, blues, greens here in the middle, and the reds here at the longer um, spectrum. So you can see the wavelengths start to get shorter and we start getting into the blues and purples. You probably all remember the Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet as being the colors of the rainbow that are split out by um, water in the atmosphere causing the rainbow or a prism that does the same thing. And this is the order of those from long uh, to short wavelength. So amplitude is related to the intensity or brightness of a stimulus. stimulus. So a higher amplitude is more intense. A uh, higher amplitude is associated with brightness, but it's also determined by the amount of photons released. So, for example, a brighter light bulb is releasing more photons. They're reaching your eye. More photons are reaching your eye. On a bright, sunny day when there's no clouds in the sky, 
more photons are reaching your retina, whereas on a cloudy day, fewer photons are getting through the clouds. <coughs> so amplitude is associated with intensity or brightness, whereas wavelength is associated with color or hue. Want to note that these two properties are not independent of one another. That is, brightness and hue are uh, related to one another. So the perceived hue of a stimulus will depend on its brightness. So here I've taken um, and manipulated in the computer. These are all the same um, wavelengths. Simply, they are brighter versus dimmer. You can um, do that relatively easily. And so this is 100% brightness, pardon me, uh, and this is 0% brightness, which is black. So the dimmer a blue is, the blacker it will look. So things that look, say, navy blue, oftentimes are simply reflecting back less light than those that are a brighter version of blue. We call it a brighter blue because it is genuinely brighter releasing or reflecting back more photons. The other couple of things to think about when we talk about um, illumination, brightness, and perception is you have to understand there is a complex mix of variables that go into what we actually perceive. So the perception of a stimulus is going to depend on a number of factors. Uh, it will depend on the light source and the surface being reflected. So if we're talking about a paint color or the color of a shirt or a pair of pants, uh, it, the perceived color is going to depend on the wavelength of light being released. Uh, that light is going to reach your paint color or your clothes color. And then whatever is reflected and then observed is the color you're actually going to perceive. <coughs> so if we have a light that emits uh, the full spectrum, then we'll get uh, whatever is absorbed by this light will be absorbed. Whatever is reflected is what we perceive. So when we see a blue wall, for example, blue light is being reflected, everything else is being absorbed. When we see a yellow wall, yellow light is being reflected, everything else is being absorbed. Now, if our light source doesn't include yellow, it can't be reflected back at us. And so light source is an important part of understanding perception as well. So sunlight, artificial light, and street lights all have different light properties. So different light sources emit different wavelengths and different combinations of wavelengths. So natural light is generally broad spectrum light that we cannot see. So it includes things like ultraviolet light, infrared light, so it's broad spectrum. But it includes certainly all of the um, hues that we actually can perceive. So natural light uh, is sort of the purest, I should say, kind of form of light. Uh, and so off you can actually now uh, purchase light bulbs that try to mimic natural light so you can get an idea of what something might look like outdoors. So lighting is a particularly important part of understanding color. This becomes important for things like interior designers who may have a color scheme in mind uh, but have to be mindful of the kind of lighting they're installing. Um, and this becomes actually pretty important. I was uh, part of a committee tasked with dealing with the uh, building of a new building on a college campus, and they were installing uh, lighting or sorry glass that would absorb a great deal of um, light that would actually heat up the building. And so one of the things they had to do uh, is it was kind of bluish looking, I guess I want to say. Um, so they had to bring in carpet samples and paint samples and shine sunlight through the glass samples to see how all of this other stuff looked in that lighting. Um, so you have to really be mindful of this uh, issue uh, when we start thinking about lighting. So when you start doing things like picking up paint colors, one of the things you should always do is try to get a sample of whatever paint color you're interested in using, taking it home and seeing what it looks like in the lighting in your home, because that's a fairly important thing to do. So artificial light is sometimes missing some wavelengths. So for example, a lot of fluorescent lights 
emit blue and yellow light, um, which looks white uh, because you add a blue light to a yellow light, uh, you get a white light, and we'll talk more about that when we talk about additive versus subtractive color mixing. But when it's reflected, colors may look a little bit off. You may have noticed um, <coughs> if you try to get ready or do makeup um, or put together an outfit under fluorescent lights, the color can be uh, difficult and oftentimes we feel like we don't look as healthy under um, fluorescent lighting. We pretty much all hate fluorescent lighting for that reason. So uh, some complex fluorescent lights uh, make it difficult for us to sort of have this accurate perception of color because of this issue. So if you're only emitting blue and yellow light, it's going to make the color of other things look off. So for example, your skin might look a little bit yellow, and that's something you obviously don't want. So uh, I really recommend LED lights. The price on them has come down dramatically. If you can catch them on sale, they really do provide a much better, much purer form of light uh, than a compact fluorescence. Compact fluorescence were a good start to energy savings, but LED lighting is really um, providing some much, much better lighting. So some lights are actually designed only to emit a single wavelength. So for example, sodium vapor street lights. They, one of the reasons why cities will use sodium vapor street lights is so that astronomers can filter out that light pollution. Uh, anyone who's lived in the city and then gone out to the country is oftentimes very astonished by how bright the stars are when you get out away from the city. And it's a really remarkable experience. And if you're a city person who's not experienced this, it's a must to do. Get somewhere out in the country where you can see stars in much, much greater detail. Um, so in a lot of cities, they use sodium vapor street lights because they emit a single wavelength of light. And so nearby astronomers can use a filter to completely block out all of that light pollution from street lights. The problem is this results in achromatic viewing conditions. So these are examples of the kind of chromatic information you see under sodium vapor street lights. Now, if you were at this picnic we see here on the left, your color perception wouldn't change all that much because of color constancy. Um, it would, it'll change, but you'll still see color differently than seeing this for the first time. We don't have any idea what any of that's supposed to look like, so it looks uh, the same. From other uh, sort of practical perspectives, this makes for some difficulties. So California, for example, used to have uh, blue license plates with yellow uh, lettering and they were equiluminant. That is, they had the exact same brightness. And so when those license plates were under a sodium vapor street light, couldn't see any of the numbers. So that had to be changed. From a dog owner's perspective, when your dog uh, goes number two outside, trying to find that brown uh, prize on a green lawn is very difficult under sodium vapor street lights because you can't use that kind of chromatic information. Um, so a lot of cities have, uh, astronomers have gotten away from a lot of this because um, there are other ways. We've got better technology. Um, and these, these achromatic viewing conditions can be really problematic, particularly for things like what color was the car that tried to run you over, and you have no idea because you don't have any chromatic information. I want to spend just a minute talking about um, a little bit more about this kind of surface. So the perception of a stimulus will depend both on the light source and the surface being reflected. Um, the surface obviously is also a very important part of that in terms of our perception. Um, this all comes together sometimes. Uh, one of the best examples I use for my s for students like yourselves um, is anybody who shopped at Hollister knows that Hollister likes to turn all the lights off. and. <laughs> then you'll get whatever you bought at Hollister out into the sunlight and it's a completely different color. In fact, it will oftentimes blind you because it's such a completely different color. That's the kind of thing we're talking about here. But surfaces also have an important component to our perception. 
So perceived hue is due to illumination and surface absorption. So we see only that light, which is reflected. So if we have a white piece of paper, it's all going to be reflected. For blue piece of paper, all the long wavelength light is going to get absorbed. Blue light will be reflected. Uh, the last note I want to tell you uh, in this, again, very brief lecture on introductions to light is perception of shiny things, because I just find this interesting. Um, so uh, the type of surface will actually determine whether something looks matte or glossy. So something that looks what we call matte is actually a rougher surface, so the lights are light is being reflected uh, in a bunch of different directions, and so it doesn't look shiny. Whereas, so here we have, for example, a matte surface, beam of light, everything's getting scattered in all sorts of different directions. A mirror, uh, if it's a perfectly designed mirror, we get one beam of light coming, one beam of light leaving. A semi-gloss surface will have a slightly more coherent um, light reflection. So it's actually the alignment of those lights that makes it look glossy. So a car that's freshly waxed, what that wax is doing is focusing those light waves so they all reflect in the same direction. So that's what creates a glossy surface. So that's our introduction to uh, light and uh, light waves and the properties of light. Uh, next up we're going to talk about structures and functions of the eye.